So thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to talk to you about digital practice, blending ideas for a winning formula. So in terms of an overview, my starting point will be a transitions to blended learning framework that we developed um, a few years ago. I'm going to uh, blend some ideas for you, uh, uh, what I call the nine C's, and that will become very clear uh, very soon. And what's informing my thinking is a study of teachers' perceptions and characteristics at the College of Science and Engineering in the context of technology-enhanced learning and teaching innovation. I was also, uh, as well as conducting that study, I was co-editor for a special issue of the Journal of Perspectives and Applied Academic Practice. And the special issue was called Transitions to Remote and Blended Learning. So I'll be introducing you to some of the concepts that have come through uh, the different works included in that. I'll also be including some examples of good practice from the College of Science and Engineering to illustrate the key uh, concepts here. And then we'll move on to reflections. So this is the Transitions to Blended Learning framework developed by Josephina Decola and myself and Kerr Gardner in 2017. And that came out of interviews with a number of staff at the University of Glasgow on their perceptions and experiences of blended learning to date. And so if we work from the outside in, we'll talk first about the change agents. Um, you can see the for one of these are the changing digital landscape. And obviously that's something that's very relevant right now, the increasing use of technology. We have um, UK higher education standards, quality assurance and quality enhancement. Internationalisation was very important, came out of those interviews, being able to reach students globally and also uh, stakeholders' expectations. So students, teachers, parents would be expecting to, to learn in these new ways. And then if we look at the hexagon structure within that, these are our six key considerations or our principles that are really important. Um, so things like institutional culture needs to be enabling, management and organisation needs to support staff to engage in blended learning. We're looking more at student-centred pedagogies. The physical infrastructure needs to be appropriate, technology, kits, Wi-Fi, etc. We need learning technology support to, uh, for staff and students to be able to, to use blended learning effectively. And we identified ethical and legal aspects as well. And if we go straight to the centre of the diagram, we've got our students, we've got staff and we've got the institution. And what we identified is that there should be institutional alignment of these three groups. And this would be done through commitment to blended learning, communication about learning and teaching, collaboration and competence. And competence is very important, obviously, in terms of being able to use technologies effectively. And so the four C's in this diagram, I guess, fed into my thinking about the nine C's that I'll explore very shortly. So I'm going to be talking about um, some of these principles in the context of a study that I conducted with teachers in the College of Science and Engineering from 2017 to 18. And there were four research questions underpinning that study. What do teachers understand by the term innovation? What characteristics do innovators and early adopters have versus the mainstream majority? And I'll introduce those terms to you in a second. How are these groups influenced by external factors such as institutional culture and how can we enhance all teachers' digital practitionership? I'm not going to go into all the details of this study but I'm going to present selected parts of it but if you're interested in reading it um, there's a paper in the special issue of JPAP. So I said I would explain the terms early adopters and reluctant majority. These terms came out of work by Everett Rogers about 20 years ago and he basically identifies the, the different categories um, as frequencies in a bell-shaped curve. Starting with the innovators, there's very few of these. There's more early adopters and then we have early majority, late majority and a very few laggards at the end. And in relation to the um, diffusion of innovations or, or in the context of TELT, the adoption of technologies, the innovators and the early adopters are visionaries and enthusiasts. So the innovators will either use technology in very innovative ways or even develop the technologies themselves. Early adopters will be among the first to use it and are very confident using new technologies. Whereas the early majority are more pragmatic, they will wait till something's been tried and tested um, and adopt a technology if it's shown to be useful. 
the late majority are much more sceptical and often adopt out of necessity, um, which is very relevant if we think about people uh, transitioning to the pivot online, for example, who perhaps hadn't used blended learning to the same extent before. And then finally, we've got the laggards who are very resistant to change and who may not adopt change um, at all, in fact. And in the study findings that I'm reporting here, none of our staff reported themselves to be laggards. So what I'm now going to present to you are the nine C's, uh, the, the winning formula as I see it. So my first C is change. And I'm going to quote um, some work here from Doug Specht and colleagues in the recent JPAP issue. So they say, on response to COVID-19, despite over two decades of development and discussion across UK higher education about digital futures, the sector was largely unprepared for this move and had to demonstrate extraordinary flexibility and speed of action. And they go on to make the point that despite the many years of government investment, it still wasn't enough to move on the, the sector, to change the sector. They go on to say, as recently as 2020, the GIST Digital Insights survey suggested that, despite the growth of digital, significant gaps remained in provision, support and willingness to adopt digital teaching practices, and many academics lacked belief that digital technology could enhance their teaching. And that brings me to my second C, which is confidence. And we know that confidence or self-efficacy, especially in technology use, is important for teaching innovation. So we have one citation there, but there are a number of them. And so when we look at the GIST Digital Insights data um, from last year's survey, we can see that nearly three quarters of staff are either very or quite confident at trying out new technologies, and around half use digital tools and platforms confidently in the classroom. Um, given there might be a response bias in terms of people who are more digitally confident, um, does that chime with your experiences and, and thinking about your colleagues too? Is, is that about right? And do you think that might have changed in the last year over the pivot to online? The third C stands for capability or digital capability. And here I'm drawing on, um, first of all, um, Beetham and Sharp's uh, digital literacies model that was developed for students. So we have your pyramid, we have access and awareness, first of all, access to technology and awareness of its benefits, skills and practices, what people do, and then identity, who are they as an individual. And Liz Bennett developed a, a digital practitioner framework um, around digital capability from this model. And if we look at some of the survey response data, so I'm going to start with access, you can see that there's no significant difference here between the innovators and early majorities versus the early majority staff versus the late majority. Then we move up to skills and you can see that there's one significant difference here in relation to being able to teach themselves how to use new software, for example, apps. And it's perhaps no surprise that the innovator early adopters are, are leading ahead with this particular skill. And here's where it starts to get interesting. So if we look at digital practices, such as designing tele activities to suit student learning needs, exploring the capabilities of a technology for learning, evaluating digital academic practice and reflecting innovations within their own teaching practice, there is a significant difference across the board here. You can see from the shading and the median dots that the innovator early adopters are, are leading the way and the late majority are, are significantly trailing behind. And then we get to the, the top level, which is around identity, being confident in their attitude to tell, being willing to invest time in exploring and evaluating tell, being able to balance the risk of innovation with its potential for learning, and being convinced of the potential of technology to enhance and transform learning. Here again, we see significant differences across the board, and we see from the median dots and the, the shading distribution, again, the innovator early adopters are leading the way the early majority are somewhere in the middle and the late majority respondents are trailing behind. So I move on to my, my fourth C now, which is two Cs really, community and continuing professional development. 
and I'm not going to present all the details from the study around other forms of, of CPD. Um, but what I wanted to highlight specifically um, is this aspect here around community. So learning informally from and with colleagues. Now, this is the type of professional development that um, you can see there's no significant difference, was universally the most popular, the most useful uh, form of CPD across the, the many different types that were listed, which included obviously more formal um, types of CPD, um, going to conferences, etc., being part of professional bodies. But learning informally from and with colleagues was by far the most popular. And here's a quote from an early adopter. It's very informal, but the colleagues that I sort of associate with have mutual interests. It's kind of informal and just kind of like bumping into people and something comes up and not necessarily when you're expecting it. So I find a lot of my ideas and so on come from just happenstance. And this idea of serendipity came up again and again in the study. And it's really important that we provide these opportunities for serendipitous encounters and for innovative ideas to emerge. And what I also discovered was that there's a difference between early adopters and early majority respondents in the sense that early adopters can see the potential for innovation from a different subject and, and transpose it into their own discipline, whereas early majority respondents prefer to see something um, in their own discipline and be able to adapt that in, in that, that very similar context. So my fifth C is creation, and I'm using that as a proxy for innovation. So how did staff define the concept of innovation? So there were a number of uh, different types of responses. Some people said it was using new technologies or tools. Some people said it was about enhancing student learning, using new teaching methods or approaches or techniques, or perhaps even using existing technologies in new ways. And what the, the focus group quotes clearly illustrate is that there's a nice link there between either using new technologies or using existing technologies in new ways and enhancing student learning. So the early adopter respondent here says anything that enhances the student learning, even if it's a small increase in their interest, if you can use the technologies to do that, I mean, that would be to me, that would be an innovation. Whereas the early majority respondent says, as head of first year and my subject, I'm interested from that viewpoint, you know, how we can use technology to provide better support to students. My sixth C is around collaboration, and I'm going to look at this from three perspectives, but the first one is student to student collaboration. So there's five different ways that uh, teachers use a virtual learning environment, according to Gonzalez 2012. You can see here to provide easy access to course materials and administrative information, to provide up-to-date additional learning resources at point of need, to provide a space for student questions and staff announcements. You can see here that these are very much the predominant ways that uh, respondents were using the VLE, with no significant difference between the categories. Then we get to the, the higher levels, which are more student-centred ways of using a VLE. So to engage students in deep thinking through online discussions, we can see here there's a significant difference with more innovator early adopters uh, using the VLE in this way than the other two categories. And then the last one is to provide an online space for building knowledge, which again, we don't see a significant difference there, but we can see that higher proportion of innovator early adopters are using the VLE in this way. This way. And that attests really to the value of student to student collaboration and how innovators and early adopters support that. The next form of collaboration I want to talk about is staff-student partnership working. And I'm going to highlight uh, very briefly um, two chemistry staff-student projects that Dr Linnea Solar kindly um, provided these as examples, um, with work she's done with Smita Adedra and Kirsty Watts and, and the two students. So these were two um, pivots to online laboratories that were pivoted to online. The first one was um, creating two interactive online lab experiments for a quant one lab using Genially. And the second one was a project to create two e-learning resources to replace two Synth2 lab experiments using Moodle H5P and Moodle Quiz. So an emphasis there on interactivity. So here are two screenshots from the Genially resources that the student made. And you can see these are very fun, very engaging, and uh, the resource received very positive student feedback. So here are some of the quotes um, from students. Thanks to Linnea for providing these. Just wanted to send a quick email to see how much I love Valerio's labs. 
being completely honest with you, chemistry is not one of my favourite subjects, but it somehow managed to make me actually enjoy the labs. They always make me laugh and I actually learn more as a result. So you can see here just the way the students designed them. They really thought about student engagement and learning um, and it's promoted a really useful resource. So that's a really positive staff student partnership. And here we see one of the outputs from the second lab um, that was pivoted to online. I'm not going to go into any of the details, obviously, but you can see the video. Um, you can see very positive um, statement. Over 80% of students stated that they'd be confident performing the lab in person after engaging with these resources. But I think what's really impressive about this example is the fact that this was a scholarship output that um, was co-authored with the student. I'm going to move on now to a third form of collaboration, which is staff to staff collaboration. And um, this is based on the work that was done um, by the flexible learning leads from different schools across the College of Science and Engineering. And they reflected on their experiences in a paper that was in the special issue of JPAP called Togetherness, the central tenant of a, an effective institutional online pilot. Um, I won't go into the details here about the seven different ways that um, they worked together. You can see, for example, developing exemplar specifications for model courses, so shareable learning designs and trialling early adoption of new technology platforms. But what was really interesting and important was that individuals from the six, uh, sorry, seven different schools worked collectively um, to identify good practice and cascade that through the schools so that there was a uniform approach to, to the pivot online and importantly, um, supporting student wellbeing during this time. My seventh C is culture and specifically institutional culture. So here again, we've got some survey results. I'm picking out two significant differences between the three groups. The first one is regarding the level of support from the head of school or management with regards to engaging with TEL. And you can see here that the innovators, early adopters, see that as more of a, an enabler than the other two groups. And the presence of a community of practice of educators using TEL. So we can see that the medians are the same here, but we can see from the shading distribution that there's a difference between the three groups with the innovator early adopters leading. What does this mean? Does it mean that the, the head of school or management were actually more supportive to the innovators or early adopters? Probably not. I'm thinking that the innovators or early adopters perhaps persisted more in the, in the face of, of challenges. And with regards to the presence of a community of practice of educators, I, I wouldn't imagine for a second that, that people who are from the mainstream majority would be um, excluded from that community, but maybe they just didn't realise that it existed or maybe they lacked confidence in terms of participating. Um, so perhaps we need to, to think about how to support that so that uh, the, the mainstream majority feel more enabled um, by the institutional culture. The eighth C is around care. Robin De Rosa said in the emergency pivot to online, we're not building online courses or converting your face-to-face -face courses to online learning. We're trying to extend a sense of care to our students and trying to build a community that's going to be able to work together to get through the learning challenges. And there was a study in JPAP by Griffiths et al, um, a socio-materiality perspective study, um, which identified issues around students having suitable study space, that there was a massive sense of isolation, and there were digital equity issues around access to Wi-Fi and devices. And here I always like to refer to Maslow's hierarchy. If you don't have the basic needs met, you can't reach these, these higher levels. So if you don't feel connected to students and you don't have access to um, to basic equipment, um, then you're not going to reach these higher levels of self-actualization. And I think this is equally important for staff as it is for students. And we come to the final C, which is contemplation or reflection. What have we learned from the pivot to online? How do we keep progressing blended learning rather than what I'd say is regressing to traditional education? You could alternatively argue that, that some forms of traditional education like face-to-face um, -face labs are incredibly important, but still, how can we progress and, and capitalise on the work that we've done? Early adopters are, are, are hugely important in driving change. Is there actually still a reluctant majority now? And how can we continue to develop ourselves as caring, competent educators? So here's the nine C's, the winning formula that I think make a winning blend. Change, how do we harness this? 
How do we build people's confidence in using learning technologies? How do we help people build their, their digital capabilities or the level of digital practitionership? Can we make sure that there's access to communities of practice and CPD that we know all staff enjoy and take part in? Creation or innovation, important to use um, technology enhanced learning and teaching to enhance student learning. Collaboration, this might be in the context of active learning, staff student partnership working or interdisciplinary staff working. Culture needs to be enabling and tolerant of responsible risk taking. Care for learners, ourselves and our colleagues. And contemplation, this is an opportunity to stop and reflect. Where do we go next? So thank you for listening to this keynote. I look forward to your questions uh, in the next part of the session.